a whā katanga te hauki tūhu, whā katanga te hauki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki utā, kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hia ki ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhunga a tihe. It's time for us to work together as a community. Māori, non-Māori, European, Asian, everyone. We need your thoughts, we need your, your um, ideas to come in. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you can only do so much. And you want to take the bureaucracy out of it, and you actually want to look at it from a moimoya perspective, a dream perspective, an imagining perspective. And with that, we can go somewhere with it. Mm. So your, your input and your whakaro and our speakers today is really important. My, one of my last events, I was at Tapapa many, many years ago um, in many roles, but my last role was Audience Engagement Facilitator and I worked with Olivia Kelsey to um, help co-produce um, Ngā Pō Wahine, um, which was epic. So here we are, just outside the Ranginui doors, which is in Rongomarai Rō, designed by Bob Yangke. And so Jen Lau, Lighting Director, um, lit behind these doors, showcasing the beautifulness of this, I don't even want to talk about this work, but the significance of this art tour here. And what, why it's important for me to talk about this is because we, we work in many spaces, including sacred indigenous spaces, but also Miriam Ralph and Kura Forrester um, actually had to rehearse this work um, in 17 Tory Street for three weeks. And I'll be talking about 17 Tory and 19 Tory in my corridor. Here we thought that no one was showing up to see this work and we were like, <laughs> we were looking down in level two going, oh, cool, there's only a few people here. And then we looked down to the ground floor and it was stormed for people. So we were at capacity, but um, the work for having Miriamma and Kura be able to perform to Alpo at um, Honoki Hawaiki was so significant. It was a one night performance and it was the last thing I've ever, one of the last things I've ever done on the space. And it's really special and it's really informed my practice in terms of working with artists and communities, yeah? Um, also, I just wanna acknowledge, I know, look at this face here. I wanna <laughs> acknowledge the mana of my cover club sister here, Tapo Ariki, and, um, this is designed by um, Ariki, and it's called Native Shit, and it was in response to an Indigenous Arts Symposia that was happening in the time, and where Carver Club invited a whole bunch of people to talk about Indigenous issues happening within their world and within their community. And the brief to Ariki was that we wanted, like, plastic islander Māori dolls coming alive and becoming warriors. And, um, and so Ariki designed this beautiful graphic. Um, and as you can see, it really speaks for itself. But I just want to acknowledge you, my sister, in terms of your mana and your, you are a Tahitian Ngāti warrior yourself in terms of everything you do. I am so proud of you. I'm so proud to call you my friend. And I just want to acknowledge you um, in terms of everything that you make, everything you do really inspires me. I, you know, we don't see each other as often, but I, I watch your feed and I, my heart is always full. And so, um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge your legacy and your impact on Carver Club as well. Yeah? It's the last slide. So this is Pari Fero or Red Rocks. Um, and the reason why I wanted to show this is because of our connection to Kupe. So if you don't know the story, and I'm going to give it in a sentence, the, the, the blood of Red Rocks stains this in mourning of Kupe's loss by his daughters. There's many stories um, within this iwi. But um, somewhere in these rocks is one of my favourite artists. I work with many artists, but one that I call my mother, Linda Lepo. And here, here she's... Um, we are making a statement in terms of her work. So Linda Lepo was the Mātairangi Mahi Toi resident, and we did this really significant, amazing work. Linda's Fafa Fene, she's fierce. So everything that I learn and, and understand is from people like Linda. Five years ago today, I was in, uh, at Grace Jones with Suzanne Tamaki, but also partying with the, the amazing late Nan Brunning. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the last time I was in this buddy was um, Nancy was here with me on location working with Linda Lippo. And um, so we would have lots of production meetings here. 
Um, I love Nan. Nan is also someone that I aspire to be in this world. Someone that is full of mana and integrity, calls it out when need to, rallies people. And it was such a huge privilege, you know, um, and I don't say this lightly, to work with someone that huge in terms of everything that they are. I'm really lucky that I, every time I look back on my birthday, I think that I was at Grace Jones dancing with Nancy Brunning and she was at my birthday dinner because I had such a big profound love and respect for her. Um, anytime there was a co-papa here, she dragged me here. Bring your, bring your tawira, come over here. And so quite often I've spoken here, Tony Mahuta, yeah. over the years because of Nancy Brunning. I also want to say I don't speak too much. I often prefer not to because I could just go blah, 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 blah. Um, so this is a long time for me to um, do any kind of panel or discussion. Yeah, but yeah. So Linda and Nan, amazing people. Yeah. Thank you so much. And what about this one? Oh, God. <laughs> I just want to remind everyone, you know, I too was once an art student <laughs> in the Hart Valley and still very bogan, you know. I had probably green hair, but this is what I do now. So last week, you know, was O Week. This is a new bunch of amazing Pacifica artists starting their journey. And, um, and here we are welcoming our first year Pacifica students. So this is a big part of my role. So I do lots of crazy things. And as Sophie knows, and Andy, because I were at work, I was curating a grazing table to the point where I was like, it needs to be glamorous, <laughs> you know? <laughs> These really, and so what we did this year was we broke tradition. We actually made ula lole for all our tawira coming in because it's something that you usually get when you're leaving, but we're like, this is your, your journey begins here. And so despite all the crazy work I do, I always have to remind myself, I too am a Pacific person who went to an art school that was trying to navigate this crazy world. And um, in some respects, I still am. I'm still very bogan. You'll see me on the weekend. Very hot <laughs> trash, very bogan. Glamorous Monday to Friday. Um, also, yes. I just really want to kind of talk about who I am, actually. The last thing I produced was the honorary doctorate ceremony for Kaufui Maono Enderman. Um, this is, was the first Pacific honorary doctorate. This was in Te Rau Karamu. So when I say produce, we give it that theatre drama treatment. Um, Fuima Ono is the first Fafa Fini to receive an honorary doctorate from Massey University. So huge achievement. So usually I'm trying to kick it with some very, very amazing academics, so I love at Massey University. Um, so that's me in the background going, choo, you know. Amazing. Yeah. So more amazing spaces. We have one of the best music studios in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, here is an artist I love to work with, uh, Matt Fayumu, who, aka Anonymous, so I'm constantly collaborating with artists through residency. So Matt did the first um, Te Wharehera Pacifica residency for us last year as well, and he was meant to realise a work for the festival. But also the Pacific disability community bringing into the space constantly, Pati Umanga, um, you know, yeah, we all love Bati, who is one of my elders and Tōkana in the space, and here he is opening up the space to bring in more people from the Pacific Disability community to record their music, write their songs, tell their stories. So this is in our big flash studio we have at Massey. That is my job, keep the door open, let people come in, yeah? So this is Linda Lapau who I talked about, first Matairangi Mahi Toi Pacifica resident. So we have a residency at Government House. And so Linda Lapo and I, and Nancy Brunning's mission was to have the most glamorous, brownest event in that forum ever, and we did. Don't you reckon, Suzanne? It was pretty flash. Suzanne was there. And what we showed was this amazing video that Linda Lapo produced where she, we were at Red Rocks and she was burning her 25-year collection. So on video, projected. Um, at Government House, it was quite powerful. It was very poignant. There were screams, there were tears. Um, people were really emotional. But then we also opened it up, did a fashion show, showed all the works that survived. But it was again, you know, we talk about indigenizing, decolonizing. And for us, that was one of the things that we can do to show that, yeah, we're present, we are here anyway. So this is the work that I do. Okay, so despite all the cool things that we do, people to this day still come up to me and go, can we talk about Carver Club? <laughs> <laughs> Including this one over here. We really need to talk about Carver Club. And I'm like, oh. So, um, and I'm just glad um, 
Ariki is here. So Ariki actually designed this logo in a bit of a process. Do you remember? Carver Club probably started eight years ago, Ariki, and probably only lasted for three years. So just to give you a really br brief history, Carver Club was a collective in my intro of Māori Pacifica artists, activists, academics, um, people in institutions. Um, so it was this radical, radical collective. And, you know, I still, you know, thinking about it, I don't know how it started, but I think it started with a simple conversation with Lucy Wheeler, where, um, who was part of the Wellington People's Collective, where Lani and I, um, both our good friend Leilani, Mr. Seal, we're talking around having a mural on a wall and how we can get Pacific and Māori engaged in the process. And we're like, let's just have a hui. And that's why we met Ariki and we had a hui and we went, actually, let's just keep having huis. You know, lots of huis. And then the chop soy hui formed, <laughs> which became our signature event, yeah? So I'm just going to, next slide, Sophie. So yeah, it just kind of grew. This one of the early car club. We just hung out outside of 17 Tory Street. We all got keys. We all just um, had lots of fun, it was BYO, um, but what it was is we created a space for unsafe conversations, that was the mantra. So Indigenous artists can come, young people, old people, and be on, one of the rules was it was a flat hierarchy, so anyone that showed up, I didn't care how established you were, or how famous you were, um, we were all on the same platform. And artists were allowed to have the agency to talk about whatever they wanted. Yeah? So there's more like, more shots, but the collective, you know, of, over the months and years became, had really cool essential key members as well. So anyone could be part of Cover Collective, but there were people that were using their skills. So we had Mish Mungutu Tia and Tony De Goldie, you know, Pacific Underground, you know, fame. We had Ati, we had Jamie, Bridget's in there. Um, and we just did these really cool radical events about really things that Pacific and Māori and queer people and Asian people and people of colour wanted to talk about. Wanted to talk about brown hair. So we had this radical event where we talked about hair. But we also were primarily based on Tory Street, but we also moved to other locations and we invited other senior practitioners to host events. So Sima Orale came to Soup Kitchen where Lani worked and we had a really amazing event for Tautai Pacific Arts, people called Breaking Bread. Oh God, this was the teaser event. It was a bit radical. It didn't work out in honest. It was called the Hearty Party. I had this crazy idea where I'd invite people to come and talk about their lives with, with a karaoke backdrop music thing. It didn't work. <laughs> people freaked out. They're like, I don't want people, you know. I, you know, So it confused a lot of people. If you're ever wanting to have a karaoke court at all, doesn't work. Just letting you know, don't even try. Yeah. So the collective eventually, you know, like Ati, Ati and, and Suzanne, Suzanne's part of the collective, yay, we all went to Tuhui, yay! We got some creative community funding and we all went to Tuhui and we all had a, we had this, um, Tane Ato is an islander kaupapa, um, at the Tane Ato gallery with Tame. Yeah, so that was us in Tuhui. Also, we'll keep going, Sophie. I'm just going to speed through this. Yeah, in the most gardens, we also, you know, Lani and a few other queer Māori Pacifica makers, activists, artists, creators were at in the most garden having this cool kaupapa. Also, you know, supporting other big events like Pūtahi, that's at Fairly Terrace at Vic Uni. So always kind of bringing the noise and bringing the kōrero and all these really signature events that supported Māori and Pacifica arts. God, we got, we got $500 once and we're like, what can we spend it on? A stamp. So we got a bit <laughs> obsessed with rubber stamps. <laughs> yeah, who's that handsome man over there? Oh, jeez. Now, the reason why he's there is because, you know, also like other groups from, from Cover Collective, so the Hawaii Cultural Centre happened, eh? So Kavika, Emilani and Kamalani formed their own kind of vibe, which is cool. Um, and that's it. Like, sorry, I've kind of rushed through this corridor, away. Eh? So this was one of the last events. So, you know, like if you look in here, beautiful, amazing, indigenous, Pacific, Maori, queer, people of color, and our allies all in this picture right here. And like I did the screenshot because people always go, oh, we really miss that space. We really need that space. And now I work with a lot of young people and I see a lot of young people and, and Gen Z are amazing. You know, I can learn so much in terms of, and I'm so proud of how they articulate themselves, how they express themselves, how they wear themselves so openly. 
And I always think, what is something for them, you know, that, how can I work with, with this new generation of makers, thinkers, philosophers, and supporting a space for them? And I actually don't know. And that's why I'm here, because I'm like, what can we do to bring more of those noise voices in, yeah? So, yeah, but I just want to say, you know, like, it cha you know, these collectives change people's lives. When I started this collective, it was in a really terrible place, and I think a lot of us we were feeling very lonely, very disorientated, and really questioning ourselves. So, you know, we do definitely need these spaces in terms of being able to take on the world quite a lot more, right? Eh? Thank you all for having me. I thank you to City Council, to the people of Te Whanganui Atara, uh, Tangata Whenua, Mana Whenua. Um, thank you so much. It is, a, it is, a, it is an honour to, to be chosen to be up here. I got really nervous too and I found out I was speaking with these two rangatira right here. Because yeah, uh, I'm the baby in my family, so I'm used to being the baby and just chilling and not, being, not hanging out with the big crew, you know. No. <laughs> But kia ora, uh, but mihi nui to our Claire Herbie for your kōrero as well. Um, Tane Mahuta, uh, you've been, you, you two have also been a huge inspiration on me as well. And my mahi here at Takirua um, has been very transformative and, and also the experience I gain also hugely helped as an artist for future projects. So mihi nui ki a koe me te whanau o Takirua. Ka pai, so um, geez, I don't know where to start, hey, there's so much. There's so much to cover, but I, I guess I'll just start where it all began for me. And then in my mind, I'll work towards, you know, a journey as an artist, but also how important creative spaces are. And your Tūranga Waiwai, I would say, is to, to the person. Because Tūranga Waiwai, the place you stand, often that is referred to where our iwi comes from, our tribe comes from, our ancestors come from, but also your Tūranga Waiwai is where you decide to stand and where is that standing place. And as an artist, that's, that's incredibly important. Where you stand and what that represents and what comes out of you at that point in time, of who you, of who you are standing with, what building you are standing at, what land you stand on, um, to me, that determines you know, your decisions as an artist, as a person who works among the land, among the, among the people of the land as well and that's how I see creative space and and so my journey you know throughout throughout all my ancestors all the way to Hawaii my tribe of Rongo Whakata especially we are a tribe of artists we descend from a line of long artists our whare nui te hauki turanga is one of the most beautifully adorned and detailed and special whare nui built in the early 1800s that is now Te Papa um, so that, that is my lineage. Um, but also that funny thing, you know, Ngāti Pūrō and uh, Tahiti, uh, both my ancestors met in, uh, is it 1769? You know, with a guy called Captain Cook. <laughs> <laughs> Rocked up the town, Tupaya on that side. My Rongofakata ancestors on the beach, and we all know what happened that day. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's always been an interesting being uh, growing up in Tūranga Nui Akiwa. Um, with my mother from Tahiti, as well as our link to Reiatea, to the Marae of Tapitapu Watea, as well. It's also the home island of Kupe himself. And so there's all, these, all, these, all this energy swirling in me. You know, I'm on the landscape where our two ancestors met for a long, long time um, with our guests from England. Right? And that's my other side as well. You know, my great-grandmother's from England who met my great-grandfather from Tokomaru Bay. Um, fighting in the Western Front in France. And then they went back to the East Coast. That's my, that's my father's mother's side. So, yeah, so um, you would say my art journey as an artist um, is, since the day I was born. So I was born into art. Um, I was surrounded by art. And that was through my father and my grandfather on my mother's side both artists, both voyagers and canoe builders who've sailed the seas um, to tell the world that we as the people of Hawaii and the Pacific are the, the greatest of voyagers on the planet. And so my grandfather did that in 1956 and then my dad did it in 1985. 
1980, yeah, 1985, with my grandfather. And that's how my parents met, through building waka. Um, lineage of two I come from, through my father, through the rock carvings in Topol, which he created, created in the 70s, and among other large-scale projects at the time. And you, could you imagine creating a rock face that large in the 70s? And think about what Māori were going through back then. Right, Māori and Pacifica. So I grew up learning these stories and these hardships <coughs> of what it was meant or also what, what it was to be an Indigenous artist and what it took to be an artist that represented your culture, your country, um, above all challenges that present to you as well. And so that, that was my upbringing. And when I was born, my father was carving the great waka te ai o nuku taimimiha the biggest wall canoe ever built in Aotearoa. You know, uh, could fit 150 people. Uh, it was about ooh, 40 foot long, made of 22 tōtara logs. That was the first 10 years of my life. My father, my family, and some of the Mongol mob. <laughs> I, um, we carved that waka. All right. um, but also comes into this, so, so, so all that was in me, but also you know, as a kid growing up, I wasn't too interested in my culture at the time because also I had Ninja Turtles, you know, I had anime, I had video games, all these things, right, Whereas on my, while I was growing up. So I didn't quite tap into my papa until I got a bit older. But when I, when I did and realised all the answers were right in front of me, you know, as an artist, as an individual, I then took the inspiration I did from pop culture that I grew up with, harnessed what my ancestors preserved throughout the ages, through my family, and here I am now creating my art in honour of my ancestors, in honour of my, my whanau, um, to share to the world. Because as, as, as Māori, as, as Tahitian, um, I think it's incredibly important to share those stories, you know, we have we have many monuments around um, Aotearoa. We have many marae. We have many we have many aspects around Aotearoa that tell our stories, colonial, indigenous, and the indigenous presence is growing. So I've always wanted to contribute to that, especially my generation, and also seeing the young ones as well. Mentioning Generation Z um, brings me a lot of hope. And, 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 and you would say light in the world because when I look at them and seeing what I'm doing right now I'm just imagining the next level what they were going to bring to the world and I've always wanted to contribute to that but also telling our stories is important um, but also to, to, for me to show it in such a grand way that you can't ignore it but also you just, you're so taken aback by it that you want to know more about it. You want, you want, to, you want to hear those stories. You want to read those stories. And, and one other thing too, you know, um, we never had a, a written language. You know, you go into a marae, that is our language. The building itself, what's on the walls, what's carved, what's weaved, what is sung, you know, what is, what is said in our chants, that's our language. What is adorned on our bodies, it's our language. And so my... My vision is to share our stories through that visual language. We were taught orally, we learnt through those ways for thousands of years. And so, and I found that our people learn better that way, um, embrace our stories better that way. Because I was that kid at school that um, never paid much attention to the book, but I would scribble and draw on it and I'd get in trouble. But I kept doing it, eh? <laughs> because that was my way to process what I was reading. I wanted to draw it or I wanted to express it and through that I remember things better. Like when remembering what carvings stand in the Farinui, we remember our whakapapa because all those carvings is someone significant to that whenua, to that whare. Whoever had built it, whoever was there, immortalised in our artwork. So that is, you would say, my mindset in a nutshell. And I'll, I'll show an example of one. This painting here I did for uh, Mo Whenua at Shelley Bay. As an artist, what could I give to the people fighting for our land? I gave them tara, 
Taraika. So that is the name of our harbour, Te Whanganui A Tara, the great ancestor Tara himself, sitting at Motu Kairangi, at his pa Te Whitu Kairangi. And you can see he's adorned in our Polynesian attire because early generation Māori, that is what we came here with. And so my, my way also is visually to remind our people and the people of Aotearoa, our origins to Hawaiki, Hawaiki Nui, Hawaiki Roa, Hawaiki Pāma Māo. And uh, Maru Kaikuru, or Maru Kaikuru, um, Maru or Uru, we say in Tahiti, the breadfruit. And it is said the name of the space they occupied referenced the breadfruit, the tree of life, the fruit of life. And so Tara grafts the breadfruit, representing the wahine and the many of the marakai and places of gathering food around Mirama, Motukairangi. Oh, Motukairangi, the great island of food and the sky, we say, to read the stars to gather your food. Right? Hence the top there. I've got many, many examples, but this is just an idea of the mahi I produce as well. So, community. So I find, I find working solo, working with a group, um, when working on an art piece, especially in the public, you know, people notice, people stop, they ask questions, uh, people get inspired. Some people question what it is or, or, or question themselves on why that artwork is there as well, especially, especially, especially artwork that relates to indigenous history. Many are positive. And that's another thing about art, especially being created live. You, you attract a lot of people within the community who, are, who, who become curious and fascinated with the story you are painting. I'm also the young ones. So these are two um, students from my old primary school, my kura kopapa from Waikirikiri, uh, up and deep in Kaiti, Gisborne. Right? And so it was quite awesome to bring in these young ones of the school I used to go in and grew up in. And, and share that with them. Um, we, did another, um, we did another trip to Hokianga as well in October, where we met a school of 40 students out in the middle of uh, a place called Kohu Kohu, Northside, at like Hoke. Right? And same thing, there we, we introduced the students to painting murals. And this is the thing, interesting thing we found out, and this is what you find out to painting murals in areas, is that um, the, lack of, the lack of awareness and knowledge of those stories. Present, there will be people that will have the, the corridor, but there's no visual representation or, or something that, that grabs people, that inspires people. And when we went, we went to Hokianga, we couldn't find anything like that, um, especially in the little township of Kohu Kohu. You know, we, we are, there are many po that stand around the land, but there was nothing to show these students who are, in, you know, in a way are in isolated areas, they don't have much to access outside of their region and so they were never introduced to their own art their own stories directly and so we collaborated with the teachers with mana whenua and so we created a piece with them and by creating it with them we shared the stories at the same time and they started to remember the names they started to remember what these meant and in short we did like the tanifa of, of the Hokianga, there's two of them. But we did one on our side, which is, who is called Niwa, or Niniwa. And then we did other parts of the story. So, yeah, so that's what I think is important too about art. It comes to the pūrāko, the storytelling. And so seeing it in that way, for our tamariki, for our students. Um, I've even had um, individuals who come to volunteer and same thing the pattern continues, they learn about our stories while working on the artwork in all aspects and forms as well. So that's a little corridor about my mahi. I could go on all day. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but uh, what I want to do now is go to the kaupapa of creative space, reimagining creative space. Wotoi um, pōneke, but also um, pōneke as a whole as well because I always believe Toi Pornike we have Toi Pornike situated in the middle of the city but I've always thought Toi Pornike could go anywhere 
You know, who's to say Toi Pōneke is in one building? Why not have Toi Pōneke in multiple parts of the city? So you have hubs, you have places that, because it's, cause it was one thing living in Wellington, but if you live in, live in Wainui like I did, you had to travel all the way here, <laughs> right? But let's say there was one in the hut, one down in Island Bay, because it's far from here, because not, not all artists have the means to travel directly in Nautilus Happy Valley. Uh, we only got the one hour bus that comes who knows when. <laughs> right? But that's accessible to those living in Happy Valley. So what I'm saying is lo more localised hubs, but you have the headquarters which is here in this part of town. Right, that's my Fokaro. So this is our studio. It has been around for 15 years. This is the creative space I'm a part of, the collective I'm a part of. It occupied an old diesel mechanics called Coastal Motors that I recall from my mind was established in the 1950s, but we've had proof that the whole foundations of this building were built back all the way to the 1930s, early. It used to be a gas station, diesel mechanics, you name it, up until around 15 years ago where the current owners vacated and a group of um, inspiring young people arrived and rented it out, right? Big empty husk, but over the years, built all the rooms, decorated the whole building. The whole building has now become an artwork that houses up to 20, uh, 20 artists at one time as well. And so there are many community projects that happen there, market days, uh, where artists to showcase their work to sell, to, to, to share with the community, especially of Orfiro Bay, um, even at the school there as well. So it's also a place to share um, and promote our work, but also we had events there, musicians, performers uh, throughout the months. So, so this is a creative hub that has been around for some time. So you can see there, in all these thumbnails, all the activity that has gone down through there through myself and all the artists who have come and gone through. That took me a year to paint on my big brush. And the biggest mamai to me, yes. Um, so we just found out today that the, because the building was purchased last week on Monday by um, an unknown buyer we, we know is from Auckland, right? Uh, we weren't unsure the week coming of the purchase, but Today they just decided to evict us. So 15 years of history, but a building that's nearly 100 years old is now gone. And so we just come into terms of that now. Um, and what I have to say as an artist, um, most of my life I was stubborn, I'll try to work in my home, you know, work wherever I could, Right, but they just became too unmanageable, especially as the art activities grew bigger and bigger and bigger. I've done art projects that take this whole room up. Right, and you've like literally in size. So I needed somewhere more accessible, um, but with, with, with the freedoms and space, because we have uh, many of our little rooms that they were built by the artists, they were brought up by the artists, but we have the main open space, which is twice the size of this room. We use for um, rock climbing, so the, you would say the most southern rock climbing wall in the southern hemisphere here is located there, which is the oldest installation of the building as well. But also that, with that large space, we're able to do many activities. And I, was, I was, wouldn't have been able to create the large scale projects I've done today, even the mural I did for Te Kura Māori and Purirua. I created the installation in the, in the studio, then shipped it to the school to install. So that allowed me as an artist, and I've seen many other artists there were able to achieve much greater things, um, work much harder to, to achieve things with the resources given, but also with the space that is available at Nautilus. But also, also like Cover Club, we're a family, and so we communicate, we work together, we are part of this space as well. And one, one thing I thought to gift the community through Creative New Zealand, through Toi Tipu Toi Rea, was to depict our ancestors, like I said, there's a lack of visual representation of a large scale. So through that, through COVID, through winter, all the way to the turn of summer, November, finished it. And invited the whole community of Orfiro Bay 
uh, our local leaders as well. And I come to talk to them about our whare toi nei. At the top there is a carving loaned by my family that my dad carved right at the foot of that building of Tangaroa, the Koruru Mask, which is the whole fragment of our sailing canoe my granddad and my father sailed to New Zealand on. That's the modi of that building and I'm going to remove it in two months. One thing is to lose the creative space, but as an artist, I have to come in the terms now with losing an artwork I've gifted to the community. An artwork that never b ever before been painted in the Whanganui Atara of Kupe's voyage and crossing past Cook Strait to the South Island where he slayed Te Whiki. That's what that represents. But also local history, red rocks, the islands, our great Tanifa, Ngakifa Taitai, the North and South Island, Ponamu, Hawaii, voyaging, bird migrations, star migrations, right? the great power of Tangaroa, who's also the god of art, adorns this building. But I was not able to create this if I didn't have Nautilus. And so that I would end on that. As, as heartbreaking as it is to, to lose our space, and after comes into terms now of losing, losing an art or a monument to, to my ancestors, um, there's always hope for a new beginning. And so us artists at Nautilus, we're still deciding who's going to go or leave entirely. We're looking for a new space. That's potentially, not, well, potentially that size, um, to house the 20 artists who require a space to work and to create things as well. So that, that is my kōrero. Um, creative spaces are very important, and I believe, like I said, they need to be open. There needs to be a lot of freedom as well. There needs to be a not lot of room for artists to communicate and move through to use a space to create projects of this scale. Kapai. So, kia ora. Thank you for listening. Right. I wanted just to really talk to the reason why um, I, um, when I first got the job at Takirua, my first kaupapa and aspiration was to get a new whare. In 1998, um, at Alpha Street, and you'll see aligned the, the walls of Naki and Whataite, our, our corridor down there, we have so many shows that have um, found their life through that beautiful, beautiful theatre in Alpha Street, um, that Mere Boynton and Kereka and Hone Koka and Colin McColl, uh, Tony Burns, um, Wikuki Ka, and um, so many of our rangatira who held space there allowed a space for New Zealand stories to be told. And so many did. And it was not just Māori, Māori Pacific, physical theatre um, uh, for our um, uh, LGBTQI community all across through there. The feminism movement had a voice there. So many places of our stories had a voice there. Cabaret had a voice there. Music had a voice there. It was an amazing space of collectivity um, that envisioned a place which came out of downstage theatre and downstage that were, at that time, creating a lot of shows that, that were also international shows coming in, they wanted a place for New Zealand artists to tell their stories. So that started as the Depot Collective uh, in 1983, 1984, 85. A collection of them came together and said, how do we find a space so our New Zealand stories can be told? And then from that um, space there, 1983 to 1985, there's a little rehearsal space that they had in uh, the depot on Courtney Place. And that space there um, allowed an opportunity to use that rehearsal space to present New Zealand works. Then it moved across to, um, uh, to the depot, uh, to Alpha Street, and that's where Takirua started to join and merge through. A Māori voice was connected through that space. So that um, by the likes of, as Grace has said, Rona Bailey, um, Kiri Kaa, Tunia Baker, who gave us the name of Takirua to weave in two, to weave in patterns together, and to work collectively as a community, that space could be there to hold the storehouse of beautiful stories that Aotearoa playwrights, choreographers, and creatives could create. And from 1990 through to 98, 98 in that building, so much work was there. Um, uh, from Lemi Ponafasio, starting his works. Shona McCullough, Auckland Festival Arts Director, her works for the Human Garden was in that space. Um, the uh, 
uh, some of our, um, oh gosh, I mean, so many on that wall um, of artists who would never have had a space to perform their works. And so the mantle that Takirua took on at that time and then Bats has taken on for the emerging following from that space has allowed a voice for so many artists who are still in the mix today, Lorraine Perry, Melon McMurama, uh, for their beautiful works like Eugenia. Um, the, um, from that space there, um, at 1998, um, a board decision because of leaking roof and leaks and the cost of that theatre to be able to maintain that space and most of the funding that they receive from Crown New Zealand going into having to try and keep the building going, uh, they made the call to make it into a production house that would stage and then create uh, Māori theatre shows and support Māori artists and telling our stories. But that treasure trove of a place, a house that stored everyone's stories and allowed a very open space was gone. And for 17 years, we were homeless. And in that 17 year period from 1998 to 2015, what was so interesting is I think as you look at the Māori arts community and the rest of the community, I think you'd see a very siloed off time of space, of people working in their own little silos, trying to get by, trying to scrape through. And the, the aspiration when I took on the role as Kahu Kura was to go, we need a home again. We need a whare. It may not be a theatre, that what we had, it may be something different, but we need a space that we can collectively have a space that people can come back and create works and explore and grow. Um, my mate used to go to Nathan McKendry because he found this place. It had been for two years um, um, with a lease sign on and no one in this top place. But the Ao Ho used to be here. And Thao Ho was a performing arts company that also, I believe, went overseas. Tor Waka was, uh, spent time with that company through in Te Ho. They were here. So it already had a whakapapa here. And then Ateria, which was a Māori drug and alcohol abuse uh, centre as well, was here too. And, um, but then this space, these beautiful wooden floors, and this space was empty for two years. So that was our benefit. We found it. We said, oh, how do we go from our little shared office space uh, which me and Grace worked together in with the conch on one side and us on the other um, into taking on this place, you know. How do you go from a $7,000 7, a year through to a $70,000 a year lease? And so we thought, well, we can bring our storage on site. Wow, if we can get Tawata and if we can get the conch to come on board and take a, a space each, then we can split that rent a little bit more. If we can open the space so that when we're not rehearsing our shows, but the community can come in and, and, for, and for me, the kaupapa was, how do we make it affordable? The most affordable space for us was Tararua Tramping Club. Tararua Tramping Club, uh, you paid $100 a day uh, for that space, but it was nine to five. So if you wanted to bring a set in, put something in, you had to move that set out at five o'clock every day and then bring it back in for nine in the morning. Not conducive for building awesome works like our beautiful tour here there, Sasha, Sasha Copeland does in this space and creates works and takes the space over. And I think for us, so our, we realised, let's not use this beautiful Toho Kainga space as a place to do classes and do those elements. We do do wānanga workshops. Let's use this beautiful Toho, the wind in this place, the place of creativity from Tāwhiri Mātia. We get that essence of breath, the essence of wind and the essence of creativity in this room here and allow the artists in here to be able to build. If you're going to hire it for four weeks, you got it for four weeks. That's, you know, we only pay $500 for a full week. It's yours, nine to midnight. Nine to midnight, or one, two, three, four in the morning, we don't care. It's yours as long as you leave the room back when you're finished, back to start so the next person can come in and then create their creations. And I remember seeing Sasha's work and, oh my gosh, the hay bales and the work that you had in this space transformed the space. It was so great. You couldn't do that at the Tararu Trampling Club though. No chance. So we thought, how do we build a situation so our set designers and our creatives have a space to actually really explore and play and it's them. It doesn't have to be clear to the side for classes like a yoga class or something like that. So we thought that was the gap that our artists needed and let's, let's uh, provide that opportunity for them. I the think I'm excited about is we're open for business again. Yay, because we're no more flooding from there. We had to close during the exhibition um, and then when the rains came down and these um, tiles came down, it was a, a, a total, too much of a hazard and a danger for anyone to come through. And, it, and, and for me, it's an element of hearing the mummy with the Nautilus with what's happening there. The element of private landlords 
in the city are terrible. Cross down there in Perumu Club as well. Terrible. I just think, come on, landlords. Come on, um, people. Yes, you've got the money to look after these, these, do these buildings, but look after the people inside them because we make this city a fantastic city to live in. So I just think the, um, yeah, how do we switch from people from a just a financial side of things to an element of collective community and what we're about here? And that's what we hope here. This is a place where we open to the wider industry uh, to come in and rehearse in this space, utilize the space. We've got a smaller workshop room as well to create stuff for readings or workshops or smaller rehearsals as well. And then we also share our desk space, hot desk space for people who want to go in and have an office away from home. Because a lot of artists, um, for my 20 years as a freelancer, I was working just from my bedroom or from my, um, when I got it next thing into a study. That was awesome, getting that step up. But it's quite hard to kind of shift from home into your arts, it's mixed there. So having a place where you can actually go and keep your work there is quite a privilege for artists. And we try and make that affordable here for our artists too. Nancy Brunning, the Ho Tutu Tu Fano. We had five amazing artists in our Pukeahu space. It was amazing. We've had Tawata here, the Conch, Māori Sidesteps have had, had time through here. Um, uh, we've had um, uh, from Red Scare Theatre Company, Trick of the Lights, um, Java Dance Company, mixing in this place through here. We've had so many wonderful shows created in this um, space here. So we've been very privileged to have that. Um, and um, to finish off through here, I'm just really excited that we've got a whare um, after 17 years of nothing at whare and now we've been seven years now in this whare. So hopefully for another seven more, at least in this place, with the aspiration that we can rebuild a Māori theatre on the waterfront, right next to the whare waka to be able to showcase treasures of Māori from Te Papa, whare waka, and then traditional Māori um, whare tāpere space would be amazing if we could pull that off. That's the moi moi a. Mōrei ke koutou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tata katoa.